Life is a winding road No telling where it goes Driving through days and nights Won't stop for traffic lights And I Alright, and welcome everyone to another episode of Successfully Chaotic, the podcast where we attack that wild terrain of entrepreneurship and life with some clarity and some education and a little bit of fun. And today I have an amazing guest with me. I'm going to let her share with you about a little bit about what she does and a little bit about who she is. And then we're going to get started with this conversation about breaking free. I know this is a journey that I've been on the last, I feel like forever, but I've been really kind of breaking into kind of my own, my own self, right? And um, I am excited to have this conversation because there is a lot of people right now out there that are on this journey and maybe you're at the beginning of this journey, maybe you're in the middle, maybe you've come out of it and you're like never going back there again where I have to wear that mask of perfection. But I'm going to let my guests jump in here and share a little bit with you about who she is and what she does. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, I'm really excited to be here um, for you guys listening. My name is Nicole Poulton. Um, I am a recovery specialist. I I help coach people through addiction and recovery. And this is re- something really personal to me. I was an addict for about six years and, you know, coming out of that and having to completely rebuild your life is, is really challenging and especially doing it by yourself and doing it the right way. Um, I think that a lot of times people can struggle with getting sober or, you know, changing their habits and making them last. You know, it's one thing to make a change, but it's another thing to actually make it last long term. And so that's what I like to do. I, I really help people get to the core root of the problem. And then, you know, we, depending on what, each individual is going through, it's a very customized system that I guide people through. But that's that's what I focus on is is habits and, and addiction. And it's, it's very fulfilling. <laughs> well, and I think it's much needed too, because even though we've come a long way, I still feel like there is still this little bit of stigma when somebody says the word addiction, right? It's like, oh, addiction. But yeah. if you think about it, it's not that hard to really come to grips with the fact that technically anybody could be an addict. And if you really think about it, we all are addicted to something. (laughs) Addiction is just a form of self-soothing. It's a way to cope with life. And we all, you know, as humans, we all have these hard challenges and these emotions that we don't always know how to process. And so, you know, whether you come home from a stressful day of work and just binge watch five hours of TV or you go and you drink two bottles of wine, you know, it's, it's all the same. We're all trying to feel okay. And we're trying to, you know, numb out the stresses of life. And so sometimes those ways that we find to numb can just be a little bit non-productive in our overall health. And so I think that, you know, we all have these ways, especially with technology nowadays, it's so easy to just numb with social media and our phones and, You know, there's so many vices that we can choose from, (laughs) but there are definitely some that can can start to have a negative effect on us and and make it to where it's actually harder to to live where, you know, it it's no longer doing us a service where sometimes it can be beneficial to come home and, you know, watch an hour of TV and just forget about your day. But then there becomes a point where it's it's too much. And now you're maybe neglecting your family or, you know, whatever it's there's always a balance. And so that's what I like with my approach is it's it's not all black and white. We all need some ways to to be OK, but we also want to do it in a good way. Absolutely. Well, and I, I love the way that you said that because, you know, self-soothing doesn't sound bad. Right. We all need that sometimes right but I do, I do think sometimes it's it's one of those things that you don't realize no matter what the addiction is you don't realize that it's a problem until it's a big problem and i don't care if you're talking about alcohol drugs tv porn you know fill in the blank whatever you know like vice that you have right yeah. but i think you know it's it's not a problem until it becomes a problem like you said and i love that now i'm i would like if you would share a little bit about your personal journey especially the challenges that you faced 
when you are struggling with addiction and trying to maintain, you know, that appearance of having it all together. Because I think, you know, a lot of us face that in one way or another. And I know I've had my own fair share of struggles in that area until I had my own, you know, breakdown and I didn't care anymore what people thought. <laughs> so I would love it if you kind of share that because again, you know, our listeners are all on a different journey and they're all in different places in that journey. And to be able to hear your journey, I, I would love if you would share that with us. Yeah, of course. Um, so mine, I always think that it's a little unique, but at the same time, so many people can relate to this because if you're the listener, if you're in America, our medical system is a little, you know, not always the best yeah. for the patient. And so my story starts when I was 15. Um, I had a back injury. I was skiing and, you know, I, <laughs> I was a little too rambunctious and I landed on my but after I went off of a jump and I had this compression fracture. And so it was not pretty. Um, I had two vertebrae that shattered into nine pieces because they buckled together. It was not oh <laughs> ideal. <laughs> but so that obviously, you know, I went to the hospital and I got a prescription for pain pills. And at the time it was when they were saying that opioids weren't addictive, but just to be sure, here's two different ones and you can alternate. So I had two different forms of painkillers, both narcotics that I was supposed to bounce between. And I ended up getting addicted to both. And so um, that happened, you know, as a teenager. And at that time, it's like I was a kid, but I think a lot of people can relate to the fact where if a doctor is telling you something is safe, you trust the doctor, like you trust oh, yeah. the authority who's telling you these things. They went to medical school, so why would I not trust them, right? And so as time went on, I was just, I think I, I did not know how to manage my emotional pain that I also had as a child. Like growing up, it, I wasn't in the best household. And so breaking my back, you know, gave me access to the drugs. But then I started using them over time for the emotional pain as well as the physical pain. And I think that a lot of people can relate to that too. Um, like if you're listening, if you have a physical ailment where you have a prescription, it's really easy to, you know, use it a little bit different than prescribed. And so that's a slippery slope that I think a lot of people can relate to. And that's my story. I went down the deep end and um, around the time I was 18, I actually, I moved to Puerto Rico for a while and I was introduced to harder drugs and real partying and it was it was crazy and at the time it you know i didn't really care i was so numb from just my own emotions i didn't know how to process anything that i had gone through and so the only solution that i had was to just create this fake reality to just you know numb out what my life actually is and just be in this altered state all the time and it got to the point where I was taking about 200 pills a month and it was just, you know, way too much and got to the point where instead of just popping pills, I was crushing them up and, you know, snorting them. And, yeah. you know, I don't know how in depth you want me to go, but it no, was I'm fine. I mean, this is your journey and this is your story. Yeah. And again, I think part of this conversation is so important to have as much as you're willing to share, because it takes away the stigma because, you know, it could be pills. It could be, you know, alcohol. For me, it was busyness. I hid in my busyness. Yes. I would disassociate in my busyness. The, 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 when I was busy, I didn't have to think about anything that I didn't want to think about, right? Because I was too busy to think about it. You know, but the problem is, is no matter what your, you know, quote unquote drug of choice is, it still can be harmful because you're not really dealing with those underlying issues. And I think that that is why you know, it's, it's important to kind of share these things because I, I have not actually had an in-depth conversation with anybody that's being upfront and honest that hasn't had some level of this, you know, and, you know, again, my, mine was busyness, but it's just as destructive, just it's, as destructive. Yeah. It's, it's wild how, like in my eyes, like when I'm working with my clients, I tell them there is literally no difference than coming home and, you know, watching TV versus like shooting up heroin. Like yeah. obviously from a legal standpoint, there is yeah. a difference and from a health standpoint, but from a, 
functionality standpoint, what you're trying to accomplish is the exact same. And so for me, I'm an open book. So when I was in Puerto Rico, I started doing cocaine and that's where things really went off the deep end. And I realized this is a problem. Like this is, it was an obvious line that I had crossed because beforehand for the first few years, you know, it was a prescription and people were like, doctors were telling me this is okay. Like it's, you're never going to run again. You're never going to be pain-free again. Like just keep taking these pills. But the cocaine, it was like, this is obviously not right. Yeah. And getting off of that, it's, it's so in, insanely important to have the ability to have a support group or people or someone to be able to talk to and someone who actually wants your best interest at heart. Like they actually care about you. And so that's what got me off of the cocaine is I actually moved back to be with people who are better influences and, but I was still doing, you know, my pills because I did not actually assess what the real problem was deep down. And it wasn't until, so I started my pills when I was 15. I overdosed when I was 21. On my 21st birthday, um, I had some friends go to Vegas and we were like, you know, partying in Vegas and everything was great. But in my mind, it's like, okay, we're going to, we're going to really go for it. We're going to party. And so um, for the first time, I really started mixing my pills and alcohol. And by the time, like we were going to go dancing and, you know, we all Uber to the club. And by the time we get to the club, the bass of the club was so loud. I was feeling so sick. I'm just like, I have to go home. Like I have to go back to the, to the hotel. So they all go dancing. I go back to the hotel and I'm just overdosing in the bathroom. And I come to this, like, it was an out of body experience. I had this epiphany of like, what am I doing? Like, this is not my life. I choose something else. And it was a profound experience. It was the worst I had ever felt, but the most empowered I had ever felt. That was a Saturday night. Sunday, I was, you know, really not feeling good. Just kind of (laughs) trying to be okay, trying to make it back home. Monday, I was clean. By Tuesday, I was using again. And that's when it was like, this is a real problem. Because I was now alone in my apartment. It was a Tuesday at like 9.30 in the morning. And I'm snorting my pills again. And I'm like, okay, this is different. This isn't a party in Vegas. This isn't celebrating a a birthday or something. There's no celebration here. This is my life. And this is not okay. And so from that day, that was the last time I ever used. And... It would, what helped, what happened to me is I got enough leverage, enough pain was then associated to actually using versus the pain of not using. And that was the big trigger for me to make the shift. So anyone listening, if you've got, you know, any kind of vice, once the pain becomes more significant to keep going down the path you're going down versus stopping and making a change, that's when it's you know, quote unquote, easy to make that shift. And so what I love with my coaching is instead of waiting to hit rock bottom, it's not like I force you into rock bottom, but we really bring up the pain that's causing you to feel by doing what you're doing. And so you can make that shift on demand because, you know, like I had to go through years of, of, creating this yeah. false reality and not feeling any emotion. Cause when you, when you numb pain, you also numb all the joy that's possible to have, like you're numbing oh. everything. So instead of you having to do that for as long as it takes until you can just by the universe to give you a sign to change, it's like, why not make that change intentionally? So it's, it was crazy. And then once I got clean, it was, I mean, it's not easy overnight, but it was definitely, um, you know, easier than using again for me. Well, and I mean, it sounds like, you know, your recovery story is obviously it, you were able to kind of come to that understanding. I know I've heard different journeys of different people that I actually know very well. And, you know, some people's recovery journey isn't, isn't that, I guess, um, like, clear right right away (laughs) um and i mean i think that that's a blessing right but i do think that you know sometimes 
it's not clear. You know, sometimes it it's going to be very vague and you have to kind of look for it. But I love I love that you were talking about, you know, when you work with your clients that you, you know, kind of help them come to the clarity and find that clarity in their own life before they hit the rock bottom, because obviously that's the goal. Now, for many of us, myself included, I had to hear rock bottom because I'm, I'm, I'm stubborn. I always said I'm that two before across the head type of stubbornness. I had to hit complete rock bottom before I was like, ah, oh, this is a problem, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but for people that aren't quite to rock bottom, there is, you know, kind of ways to be able to find that clarity and overcome whatever addiction or, you know, even if you're not classifying it as an addiction. Because, I mean, again, a lot of times you, people people say addiction and they automatically go to drugs or alcohol. Um, however, it's, it's yeah. just that's what an addiction is. It's just a negative habit. Yep. yep. It's, you know? well, and I, and I love, I, I love that because it is, it is a, it's a bad habit. It's a habit that is allowing you to hide from what's really going on in life. That's mm -hmm. allowing you to disassociate. Um, because I think that many of us like say disassociation, right? I, I still will disassociate from time to time. Um, and that doesn't mean it's an issue at this point, but I have disassociated so long in the past that now I'm very clear about, okay, well, like you mentioned earlier, sitting down and watching something for an hour, fine. Sitting down and not getting up for a week, not fine, right? So you have to kind of figure that out based on your own life, your own goals. Um, and disassociating is, it's all just a form of protection. Yeah. You know, that's your brain's method to protect you. And same thing with our habits. We pick up our habits because it, it serves us in some way. Like we all, another thing that I teach my clients, um, the six human needs, we all have the same six human needs, but we're all getting them met at different, in different ways and in different priorities. So when I was, you know, using and in my drug addiction, I was getting a lot of like certainty from using because I knew if I were to use, I would feel better. There's also variety because as I use, it's a different experience. There's significance because I feel, you know, special and cool because I'm using drugs, which is the dumbest thing ever. But then I also feel like love and connection because the people that I'm around are also using drugs. So it's like I'm getting all these needs met, but it's all negative. Yeah. And so the goal is to find, OK, what are the needs that are being met by this negative habit, addiction or whatever? And what are other ways that we can get this need met in a more positive way? Because we, I mean, we're like 60% habit as humans. We all default to these habitual routines. Absolutely. And so we have to be intentional about what habits we want in our life, because without being intentional, we just default to the easiest path to feel good. No, 100%. And I would love it if you would share maybe some specific strategies or insights that you found like particularly effective, whether it's with you, your clients or both. Yeah. So I create a method. I was my own first client. Like I had to learn, you know, I was in the trenches doing it by myself the hard way. Um, I didn't know that there was resources out there to actually help you, you know, get out of this tough stuck spot. And so along the way, I, realize that just like any challenge, addiction is really like climbing a mountain, right? So it's like we all have challenges and we all have to start at the bottom, whatever our bottom is. And as you go up, there's different levels. You know, you go up, you go up, and then maybe there's a little valley that you have to go down before you can go up again. So, you know, it's it's climbing a mountain. And so I created this acronym called CLIMB. It's my CLIMB method. This is what I walk all my clients through. The C stands for clarity. This is the most important part of getting sober because what a lot of people do, and when I say getting sober, that could also look like, you know, if you binge eat food, it's like, okay, well, let's get clarity on why you're binging and not just, you know, eating with the family at meals. Like there's so many different ways that we could be quote unquote addicted. So when I say that, just know as you know, you listening, it could apply to any area of life that you don't like this habit of. You can apply the same method too. So the C is clarity. We need to get super laser clear on you know why you're doing this, what needs it's meeting, um, all all of those things around clarity. I have a lot of like self-reflecting questions that I ask 
Then we go into the L and that's leverage. And that's where like when I was getting sober, it became more painful to keep using versus stopping. Um, so we get leverage for you and it's, it's really intentional and it's, you know, when you're doing it by yourself because the universe is making you, it's really, really hard. But when you're being guided through it, you feel safe while you're feeling the pain building up. And then we can actually like end on a good note. You don't have to just feel like you're completely lost and helpless. You know, we, we then implement, you know, your strategy. So going from leverage, we go to the I and that's intention. And when it comes to the intention, that's where you look at your human means. There's six of them. There's um, certainty, variety, significance, connection, or love. And then those are your primal needs. And then there's um, your growth needs or your spiritual needs. And that's growth and um, contribution. So we assess what your negative habit, what means it was meeting and in what way. And then we look at those same means. How can we meet them in a better way that still aligns with what you were doing in the first place? So like, for example, for me, um, I also was addicted to smoking weed. And when I was getting off of weed, I realized that in the clarity phase, I realized that the addiction or the craving, quote unquote, was met not when I actually was high per se, it was that first 30 seconds of just calm that I felt. So it's like, okay, knowing that that's what I needed from it, it was actually, you know, like a huge inconvenience to be high for a few hours. I didn't actually like that part. I only liked that first 30 seconds of calm. So what else can I do to achieve that, that 30 seconds of calm or actually more time but to be calm and to do it quickly because it has to be easier than your addiction or whatever the bad habit is. Like what we, what we intentionally replace has to be an easier outlet than the addiction. Otherwise it's not going to stick. And then we go into the M and the M is for meaning. And that's where I kind of talk about your mindset and the meaning that we place on things has everything to do with the experience and the emotions that we feel. And so we talk all about emotions and learn how to manage emotions. And so that way you're not just bouncing from one bad habit to another bad habit or one addiction to another addiction. And then we go to B and B is balance. Balance is really because we're all so different and everybody's definition of sobriety is extremely different. So, and when it comes to sobriety, it's like, if your problem isn't drugs and alcohol, if it's, you know, watching too much TV and that's the, the problem that you're trying to go down, it's not all or nothing. You know, like for me, it's all or nothing with cocaine. Like I cannot do any cocaine, but I don't expect you to follow me exactly and never watch TV again. Yeah. You know, same thing with, if you're a binge eater, I don't expect you to just never eat. That's not gonna, that's not gonna work. So we have to look at what is the balance ratio that's right for you specifically, and then apply that and keep it going for your life. Because realistically, the goal is not to, you know, the goal is to create a life that you don't have to run from. You don't have to fight trying to get sober based off of willpower alone. It's like fuel. So it'll just burn up really quickly. So even if you can, you know, stay sober or, you know, not watch TV for a month, it's like, well, that's really great, but it might not last long term if you don't go through all of these components and get the clarity as to, well, what are you really running from? Like, what are you trying to avoid? What emotions don't you know how to process and go through all of these things to where you find out like, okay, well, sometimes I do numb because I'm really stressed and that's okay. And I can watch this much TV and that makes me feel okay. Versus if I watch this much, now I feel like a failure or whatever. So we really tailor it to the specific person. And if you're okay with this, I have an ebook on my website. Um, I would love to give away to the audience oh, for absolutely, free. Absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. It, it really kind of goes through these same points and descripts how they can walk through it and kind of help themselves through it a little bit if that's what they mean. But I, I'm really proud of this method. It's been working really well. It worked for me. I'm five and a half years sober. I'll be six years in January. So 
I mean, if it's working for me, I can guarantee it'll it'll work for almost anyone if they can actually apply it and and get the clarity they need. The clarity is really the foundation. Absolutely. Well, first of all, congratulations on your sobriety, because I mean, I know that that takes a lot of work and I'm sure there was lots of struggles along that journey. Um, you mentioned about the ebook. I'll make sure and get that link from from you. And if you're listening to this on the podcast, the link to that ebook will be in our show notes. Um, I do want to kind of circle this to our like our audience. Mm -hmm. it, it mainly consists of you know women and moms and entrepreneurs. And I know this message that you've been saying probably resonates with most of them on one level or another because you know when you're balancing just life and business, it's a lot of stress and pressure. And I know you mentioned stress multiple times during this conversation. And I, I really want to kind of circle this to uh, you working with with people. I'm, I'm, I'm taking an assumption here because I did not ask you this before, but I'm assuming that, that some of the women that you work with, and maybe even men that you work with, you know, um, their problem isn't necessarily drugs and alcohol, but it comes from trying to keep up with this idea of who they are supposed to be, why are they, you know, supposed to be that way, et cetera. And I, I only ask this because I've, I've, no, I've had clients, um, especially in my wellness world, that um, it's been very much that conversation, you know, and I know I've experienced it myself again, you know. It's that the bar that we feel is the set way up here that sometimes we make it. And sometimes, you know, if you're like me, or you're, it's a hot, fiery mess. And, you know, I think the idea that we're supposed to show up 100% every single day, if we think about it, is actually completely ridiculous. But yet we beat ourselves up when we don't. And I kind of wanted to struggle. Do you work with people on that on, on a regular basis or you know is it more geared towards something else yeah so uh, my focus is addiction just because that's you know yeah. i can really relate to that um but really everybody has habits and so it can it applies to everybody and i do really like working with people who you know it might not be an addiction but when it comes to like you said keeping up appearances keeping up with what their expectations are, what they feel the world has expectations on them, it can get a lot. And I think a lot of people don't realize that when they have these expectations that they feel are being put on them in one way or another, they are self-soothing in a way Absolutely. that is not yeah. beneficial. And so that's where I focus on, where it might not be drugs and alcohol, but there is some way that that self-soothing is not helping them with reach their full potential. And so we can look at that and, and assess, you know, go through the same process and, and the focus is different. Like I have some clients who the focus is quitting marijuana. Some is quitting alcohol. Some is quitting a porn addiction. Like it's very different and it's all, um, I like to do one-on-one. -on -one. So it's private. It's very discreet. Nobody's going to know your business, which is I think really important where, yeah out of the resources available to most people, it's, you know, a group setting or it's in person public where it's like, you might meet, you know, run into someone that you actually know, and it's harder to want to get help. And so with this being, you know, virtual, you could be anywhere in the world and nobody's going to know, but we can still help you reach the goals that you have or to stop, you know, the negative self-soothing in one way or another. Cause that's another thing. Like, if somebody's doing something and they don't feel like it's quote unquote bad enough, it's really hard for them to want to go get help where what I love to specialize in is you can get help before you actually are at rock bottom. You don't have to hit rock bottom because rock bottom will always have a basement. Oh, there's yeah. always a deeper level. And so once you recognize that there's a problem, it's like, okay, well, what do you want to do? Do you want to keep going on this path for a few years until you can't take it anymore? Or do you want to nip it in the bud right when you recognize it, you know, an easier shift and build the life that you actually want to be living? Well, I know with season nine, we've been discussing chaos to clarity. <laughs> and I know that your journey definitely fits into this theme. And, you know, just 
emphasizing the transition from an inner chaos to clarity and balance is again something that no matter what your vice is like we've said several times in this episode is something that's completely achievable let me ask you what advice would you give to empower women to prioritize their well-being and mental health especially if they're in a demanding role and you know that would allow them to maybe start to step out of these bad habits no matter what it is and into more clarity yeah i think the like the number one thing that would really be beneficial for you to do anyone who's listening is that those self-reflection questions to i i am biased i really like journaling i think that that's a really great way to get your thoughts out of your head so if just a couple minutes a day or you know a half hour every week you can just kind of put all of the stresses that you feel in in writing then you can see it and understand like, okay, well, why am I feeling these stresses? Who's actually putting this on me? Like, is it a boss? Is it my family? Is it myself? And realize if it's myself, you can give yourself some grace and yeah, high standards are amazing. But at the same time, it's not great if it's beating you up and beating you down to where you're not going to be your best week over week, giving yourself the grace every day that if you're showing up today with 20%, that's fine. Just give all of your 20%. You don't need to give 100% every day. That's not realistic. <laughs> and we're going to have bad days. And to understand sometimes we, we have bad days and that's okay. The goal is not to never have bad days. It's to shorten the length of that bad time. So instead of a full, a full day, it's like maybe it's a couple hours. Maybe it's an hour. Maybe it's 30 minutes. It's like how fast can you change your state? How fast can you change your mindset into getting out of that? And and another thing is like, we will always have problems that, you know, that's just being alive. The goal is not to not have problems. It's to upgrade our problems into something worth fighting for. So something like, you know, getting rid of your vice, whatever that may be, food, drugs, alcohol, whatever. But that's a problem that's worth solving because then once you solve that problem, you're going to upgrade to a much better problem. You don't have to worry about you know, having to fight this craving anymore because the craving actually dissipates when you when you solve the problem the right way. So I really think that, I mean, I'm just so biased with journaling. It, I have been writing books over here, going through my, um, my recovery. It's like any emotion I'm feeling, just to learn how to process it, I actually have to see it in order to understand what I'm feeling. Because so many times we don't have emotional literacy. We don't have emotional intelligence. And so by writing things down, it helps us reflect and learn from the thoughts that we're thinking. And I think a lot of times by not writing those down, we just try and, you know, push through and just solve the problem in our head when we don't actually understand what the real problem or the root of the real problem is. And so that's why you feel burned out is, you know, you're just spinning your wheels. Absolutely. Well, and I know I've, journeyed that journey many, 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 many times. And I think a lot of our listeners probably have too. And I think you're 100% right. You know, being able to look at your problems kind of on paper, or I like to draw my, I'm a doodler. So I like to draw stuff out and I, I'm, I'm very big on like the one word and little doodles and stuff, but being able to kind of get it out of my head and onto paper is, it has been something that's worked for me as well. And I love that. And I also love that you mentioned about you know, um, kind of breaking your day up. That's something that I started doing a long time ago because like old Maria used to, you know, make my plan for the day. And then the first inconvenience that like threw my plan off, I'd be like, well, that's it. The whole day screwed. It'd be like 9 a.m. But I, would, I wrote off the whole day. That's it. It's ruined now, you know? And then I, so I had to kind of get my head wrapped around that, you know, I could break it into quarters into hours, you know, and for me, that helped a lot because, you know, if something didn't go the way it was planned, it didn't wipe the entire day. It might've just wiped that half hour, that hour, that quarter, mm -hmm. whatever. And, you know, that really helped because I love plans. I am like a planner uh, fanatic and I liked my little pens and stickers. And it, so it wasn't only like ruining that, but it was ruining my art, right? <laughs> it was ruining my calendar <laughs> art, um, which still- You know, a funny, a funny, um, it, exercise that I've heard. Um, if you're a planner like yourself, something that is really funny when you're, when you have a situation that kind of ruins your day, 
instead of letting it ruin the whole day, literally schedule into your calendar, throw yourself a pity party and it lasts an hour, you know, have your pity party. That is totally fine. And then when, you know, when the calendar strikes done, you're done with that pity party, you have to move on with your day, but it gives you that understanding, like you, your feelings are valid. It's okay to have your plan ruined and to be upset about it. That's okay. But it's not okay or ideal to let it ruin your whole day or your whole week, you know? So planning out your pity party and scheduling it, there is an end time to that. And then you can move on. I love that. I think that's perfect. That, I mean, living a positive life doesn't mean that you're positive 100% of the time. And I think that's kind of, there's, there's this, there's this, I guess, thought process that, oh, positive vibes, positive life. But it doesn't mean that like today doesn't suck. You're going to have lots of today sucks. You know, no matter how much you try to gloss it with glitter and all that kind of stuff, there's going to be days that's going to be like, well, this really sucks. And I yeah. try to find a glimmer, right? Like, okay, well, I'm going to sit and kind of bask in the sun. The sun feels great. Today sucks. Sun feels great. Yeah. But, you know, <laughs> I think that that is something that you know, a lot of people are kind of like stepping into this positive life, positive vibes. They're still, kind of, I struggle with it first. I'm like, I'm well, positive mean, about that. <laughs> there's ups and there's downs. Yes. You can't get rid of the negative emotions. They're going to be there. It's just how long do you want to stay there? Yep, absolutely. Well, and I love that you said feel your, uh, your feelings because your feelings are valid. And the more that you try to sweep them under the rug, they're going to come out at some point anyway. Yeah. So you might as well go ahead and feel them right now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that pressure will build oh, and yeah. you can't hold it forever. Yeah. <laughs> well, can you share with people where to find you? And I'll make sure that the link to the ebook and everything is in the show notes. But that way, if somebody's wanting to kind of connect with you or follow your journey, they'll know where to find that. Yeah, well, if you want to schedule a call with me, that's best to do it through my website. And that's just NicolePolton.com. Um, and then on all of my social media, I'm Nicole.Polton. And, you know, that's Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. Um, yeah, to follow the journey. But to book a call and to get the ebook, that will be on the website. So NicolePolton.com. All right. And if you're listening on the podcast, you'll be able to find all of those links in the show notes. And I really am glad that you all joined us today on this episode. And I want to thank my guests for joining me today. This is, yeah, it's been great. I mean, it's really, this, your story is just really, like I said earlier, really wraps into our overall theme of chaos to clarity. And I want everybody listening to remember that it's okay to embrace the chaos of life because it's just part of life. And in the end, it's what makes our path unique and beautiful. So stay tuned for more episodes of Successfully Chaotic as we continue to explore the highs and lows of life and entrepreneurship. Until next time, we appreciate you. Life is a winding road. No telling where it goes. Driving through days and nights. Won't stop for traffic lights And I, I really wanna know